Hello, welcome to Business Life. Coming up, price of liquefied petroleum gas to go down by about 7% from tomorrow. We will hear from the LPG marketers. We expect that the, the significant uh, decline in the price of finished product will, will impact uh, negatively on the price of, of LPG. And it's expected that the price of LPG on the local market should go down by between 7, 5 to 7%. If we are lucky, competition can even drive that further to about 10%. Also in this bulletin, Moody's Investment Services warns of more sovereign debt crisis among emerging markets than previously seen in the century. The creditors has changed dramatically. In those days, it was pretty much exclusively commercial banks. Do I think we will see more frequent sovereign debt crises in the next few years? I think certainly yes. Plus, former managing director of Stambeck Bank Group, Al Hassan Andani, pushes for Ghanaian businesses to consider other parts of the continent for investment if regulatory environment is unfavorable. The regulatory restrictions here may be that government is not conscious about orchestrating enterprises. But we have details of these and many others lined up for you. Please stay on. Always a joy to have you on. I am Pius Kujubaka. Straight to our very first story. Prices of petrol and diesel are expected to go up from tomorrow, June 16. That's according to the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Ghana COPEC. Now, the expected increase in petrol and diesel prices for the second time is largely due to a 4.16% depreciation of the CD to the dollar in the last two weeks. Now, let's hear from the Executive Secretary of COPEC, Duncan Amwa, calling on government to remove some of the taxes on petroleum products to lessen the burden on consumers. The second pricing window for the month of June is set to commence in a few hours. And um, what we pick from the markets, uh, both locally and internationally, uh, together with the Forex bit is that you are likely to pay a little more for petrol, uh, pay a little more for diesel. LPG is likely to remain stable over the period. Uh, we are expecting uh, between 2 to 5% uh, for the second window, uh, June. And this is uh, simply informed by uh, the Forex uh, position, which has seen the CD from a previous position of uh, averages 11.38 uh, to current 11.87, uh, if you do interbank. Uh, that is some 4 5% variance. Prices of the product itself uh, has not increased. Unfortunately, uh, the city would force all of us to pay a little more for the coming window. Well, the LPG Marketers Association of Ghana is predicting about 7% depreciation in the price of LPG gas from tomorrow. Now, according to the association, the reduction will be caused by about 10% drop in the prices of the commodity on the international market. Gabriel Kumi is vice chairman of the LPG Marketers Association of Ghana, and he explains the reasons behind the reduction. If you look at the international price of the product, um, um, the window that closed on the 11th, we saw LPG finished product of uh, uh, LPG declining by, uh, by 11%. Indeed, it declined by 11.5%. By uh, crude oil has seen a relatively stable in terms of pricing. We've been hovering between uh, 73 to $76 per barrel over the past two weeks. Uh, though the city hasn't uh, uh, been able to, to hold its own against the dollar, we expect that the, the significant uh, decline in the price of finished product will, will impact uh, negatively on the price of, of LPG, and it's expected that the price of LPG on the local market should go down by between 7, 5 to 7 percent. If we are lucky, competition can even drive that further to about 10 percent. So, beginning tomorrow, uh, consumers should, should expect some respite in terms of the price of LPG. The city is a major threat. I always say that the city, of all the factors that, that influence the price of uh, petroleum product. The city is the only factor that we have control over. Uh, we don't have control over uh, crude oil. We have no control over finished product of the international market. The city is our own. That is where we can control. So once we are able to control the city, 
uh, we are likely to see uh, some, some, some positives. But if we are not able to control the city with the, with the price of crude oil, it, it, will, it will keep going up. So if your city is not under control, you, you should expect that uh, the price of petroleum product will continue to go up. All right, so let's get onto the phone lines and speak to the chief executive of the Association of Oil Marketing Companies, Kwekwa Jimandria, for more on this. Pleasure you could join me, sir, on Business Life. Now, what is the situation when it comes to prices of petroleum products for the second pricing window, you will say? Um, what's happening is that uh, the big crude in the world price is, um, just went down marginally from $76 per barrel to $75.46 per barrel. Which is about 0.8% drop. Then, um, the, what you, you like to hear is that the world market price for petrol, for instance, went down by 0.3%. And that for diesel went up by 0.9%. Hmm. So, then, what really. Then, then LPG. Go ahead, sir. LPG went down by 4%. All right. And uh, our dear old Ghana city also. The, uh, Depreciated by 4.24 percent. Mm. So, invariably, if we put all together, we expect to have an increase in the petrol and diesel by 3 percent, largely because of the CD dollar relationship. All right, so I want to know one more could be accounted for the increase beyond the CD depreciation, which you've um, clearly stated. Which one? Which one do you want to increase? Beyond? I am asking you to um, tell me uh, what more could be accounted for the increase beyond the CD. Largely, basically, that's what is it. I'm not an economy. So basically, the economists who are the ones who are to explain why we are having it in the any other external factors after that. And what is happening, and we look at how we can price, you know. So basically, the other factors. And normally, you know, in the economics, we have all that is uh, the term variable, some other factors, which they can, they can go along with it. Mr. Jimandria, how is the industry doing now, looking at the current challenges facing the economy? How are things looking like? Yes, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not really good. In fact, when you find ourselves a very unstable situation, and uh, it says that we don't know what's happening, especially the way I see the dollar relationship is. You can, can put the thing out, but you can't put the thing out. Uh, let me get your thoughts on the uh, Gold for Oil program as well, because there are suggestions that um, it should be reviewed. Do you side with that? Uh, review in what fashion? Well, there are some who believe that, um, you know, the initiation of this Gold for Oil program is not getting its intended um, purpose. So, for which reason they believe it should be reviewed? Well, I don't understand what the review is. I mean, if it's intended purpose, well, that's with the government. We, we have our own objective. Our objective is we look at it as an opportunity for us to get a product all the time. When the product is available is at a very good price, we go for it. But if we are having uh, other generations in such a way that it's affecting the, the pricing mechanism or it has an effect on the pricing, obviously it costs it cost to be worse. Mm -hmm. So, that's where we are because we have about the good and less than ten percent of the digital product that we need. And we are securing more than ninety percent of the things that we need from the outside. And the pricing has been good so far, except maybe this week that will have a marginal increase. Anyway. So uh, for for the business person, this one is uh, the atmosphere is better. 
All right. We are indeed grateful for your time here on Business Life. Um, Kwaji Mandia is the Chief Executive of the Association of Oil Marketing Companies speaking to us there. Let's move on to some other stories. And Moody's Investment Services is warning of more sovereign debt crisis among emerging economies than previously seen in the century. Ghana has already been classified as a debt distressed country. According to the sister company of Moody's Ratings, there will be frequent sovereign debt crisis in the next few years. However, that will not pose a threat to the global financial system. Lisi Bashir is a professor at the University of Edinburgh speaking at Moody's Global Emerging Markets Summit 2023. We are, I think, certainly on the verge of more sovereign debt crises than we've seen previously in this century. But I'm not sure that it will resemble the 1980s in this respect. Thus far, we have not seen the larger middle-income countries, the Mexicos, the Brazils, need to restructure their debt. Moreover, the composition of the creditors has changed dramatically. In those days, it was pretty much exclusively commercial banks. Do I think we will see more frequent sovereign debt crises in the next few years? I think certainly yes. But will they pose anything like an existential threat to the international financial system? I don't think so. And now, former managing director of Stambik Bank Group, Al Hansan Adani, is pushing for Ghanaian businesses to consider other parts of the continent in expanding the operations if the regulatory environment in the country is not friendly enough. According to him, other jurisdictions may, have, uh, may be in need of services provided by enterprises from Ghana, hence the need to take advantage of other good uh, business conditions to build the operations. He was speaking to Joy Business after making a presentation at the Building and During Business Conference organized by the LVS Africa. The conference was under the theme Survival and Business Growth in Times of Economic Turbulence, Weathering the Storm and Thriving. It was aimed at providing some leadership skills to entrepreneurs and supporting other business aspirations. According to the former banker, Al Hassan and Danny, businesses must look beyond the shores of their home country if they feel restricted. So let's be clear. The, the regulatory restrictions here may be that government is not conscious about orchestrating enterprises. But if you set up your company in Ghana and you are solving a problem, and which problem is not confined to the shores of Ghana, you can take that company and orchestrate in, and, and, and run it in another jurisdiction totally free of the Ghana government. And I said, MTN is in how many countries? How many governments do they transcend? APSA, Barclays, Standard Bank, there are several countries, different governments. Why, why are those companies running around? Shell, Total, mention them. They're in different, different, different countries. But you go in, so you know, you build a culture for your company and take it anywhere. Companies can overcome jurisdictions, they can over, overcome, you know, there's literally no, they, they work 24 hours. Mr. Andani also called on government to make conscious efforts in growing small businesses to become African giants. The prices just don't come into existence by default. They are orchestrated. They are orchestrated by states. They are orchestrated by the shareholders. They are orchestrated by leaders. So if we take South Korea, South Korea basically has probably very little natural resources. But South Korea has some of the leading global brands those are enterprises. Those enterprises were orchestrated by states. They were orchestrated by states. Then you have, of course, you know, places like in America, free enterprise, but people come up with very bright ideas and themselves and investment bankers and shareholders orchestrate to take that business outside of the jurisdiction of America. Other speakers were of the view that the African continent has small opportunities that are yet to be tapped into. Because Africa represents an opportunity, an opportunity which, if harnessed and nurtured, uh, will put us, uh, 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 will allow us to leapfrog uh, the so called developed nations. And that is why I hack on about Africa, but I accept that Africa is not a unitary uh, state.
All right, so let's make sense out of this um, proposal by Alassane Adani. And joining us via Zoom is um, a senior partner at AB and Davis Africa, David Ofusudate, um, for more on this. Pleasure you could join me, sir, on Business Life. I'm pretty sure you've listened to Mr. Adani's proposal that if the state will not support the growth of businesses, basically Ghanaian businesses, maybe they should be looking elsewhere for their growth. Do you agree with him? Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. I can't be clear, sir. Well, I mean, for starters, I don't think I was at the event and uh, I just joined the Zoom call. I don't think I heard Andani say if the state will not support the to look elsewhere. But I, I mean, if that's what he said, uh, fine, we can put it in context. The whole session had to deal with how businesses can grow. And what I heard him say is that business growth should be engineered, or it can be engineered. It can be engineered. It's not uh, always done uh, as a result of anything that, uh, I mean, not done solely by the private sector. So he was advocating for an engineered growth. That's, that, that, that's what he's talking about. Now, the question as to whether businesses can look uh, uh, elsewhere, I think it's more of self-help. Is there something businesses can do uh, in the absence of direct government support? Yes, there's a lot that they can do. So for example, businesses can look at sources of doing distribution as a method of expanding, uh, sources of franchising their services to uh, uh, other uh, businesses elsewhere. Uh, so I think I will not want to put it as if government is not helping, uh, businesses should look elsewhere. But what can businesses do themselves to actually create uh, that self-help in addition to what government uh, may be uh, able to do? So that's, that's, that's the context within which I want to put mm. it. Uh, in that stead, what can businesses uh, do at this time um, co to complement what government is already doing? I haven't said whether government is doing something in the context. I'm just <laughs> trying to say that. Uh, businesses can self-help, but there are quite a lot that businesses can do. So if it is your intention to grow and expand to become a globally competitive or let's say an African African continentally competitive business, which is the context of Mr. Andani's speech, one of the first things to do is to make sure that your product that you sell or your service is upgraded to the standard that it will be accepted as being internationally competitive. Without that upgrade, an upgrade is separate from upscaling. Without that upgrade, you cannot even sell in the international market. And people often tend to talk about us, I mean, upscaling without first upgrading to the standard that is acceptable internationally. That they definitely uh, can do. Businesses can also identify entities which need their services. So for example, if you are not a multinational or you are not intending to be a multinational you want to remain an sme the products you produce may be an input to that which a multinational uses and therefore it is part of the value chain of the multinational and helps you be able to identify markets of uh, of let's say an industrial uh, subcontracting based upon which you can supply goods uh, uh, to them in, in in a world where there is a lot of tension between china and us hopefully this will be resolved very soon. There are supply chain chain dynamics. And these are opportunities for businesses which can meet some of the supply chain uh, 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 challenges to approach directly that's, and provide themselves as an alternative. We must admit that government do something. I mean, that's something. Uh, and, and governments all over the world. So you have Ghana Export Promotion Authority, for example, which I'm aware, help businesses to identify markets, etc. My point is we shouldn't depend on them alone. Uh, there are times businesses are not even prepared to take advantage of policies that government implements. So businesses should do something and not re rely only on government. There's a lot that businesses can do. All right, so let me pick your thoughts on this. Um, what do you also make of arguments that government should identify some businesses to support them, just like Dangote of Nigeria, um, who was deliberately um, supported by their government? Well, I don't know uh, if what is generally said about Dangote being deliberately supported by their government is true, but on the assumption that it is, uh, so be it, and that being the basis. But I do know, for example, that there are countries like South Korea, 
uh, uh, as an example, uh, China, even in the US, where certain companies are consciously uh, uh, supported for them to become multinationals. Uh, Japan did a similar thing, the Toyotas of this world and all the rest. Mm. These were conscious efforts which were done to grow them. And I'm in full in support of that policy. What I'm against, though, which what this is what tends to be the case in, in, in some African countries and where we politicize everything, including business. So if the government or a government, and I'm not particularly talking about the MPP's government or NDC's government, but if a government decided to actually promote, we should ensure that is for businesses who meet a defined criteria, mm. businesses who want to expand, businesses who have upgraded themselves, businesses who have endured, who can resist the turbulence of the times, businesses which know how to do business internationally, not businesses which overnight, because they have access to political uh, 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 corridors, are uh, engineered. What happens to some of those businesses is that when there is the least uh, headwinds, then they are unable to survive, or if there is a political change, then the next government kills that business. We must have a situation where we are promoting Ghanaian businesses to become African giants and global giants, consciously created. So yes, it, it, it can be done, governments can do it, but we should have a criteria that make it very clear that we are selecting these businesses on the basis of their merits. And more importantly, that we are selecting businesses in strategic sectors which Ghana wants to take advantage to create a multiplier effect and become continental giants. That we can do, and there are several ways that we can do that. Mm. Let's end the conversation here, yes, sir. Grateful you could join us on Business Live, speaking to us there. David Fosudote is our guest on the program. Let's move on to some other stories. And tomato sellers at the famous Tichiman Central Market in the Buno East region are worried about the negative effects of the Boku conflict on their trade. Queen Mother of the Tichiman Tomato Sellers Association, Nanase Wabonso, says the conflict is adversely affecting their businesses as traders who travel to Burkina Faso through Boku risk losing their lives en route to their destinations. Correspondent Anas Sabit has been speaking with some of them and has come through with the following report. Boku has over the years been an important trading center due to the fact that it is close to two major borders, Togo and Burkina Faso. However, the recent Boku conflicts has scared many investors away from the once vibrant trading center. The effects of this seemingly unending conflict has gone beyond the borders of Boku as tomato sellers at the famous Tichiman Central Market who travel to Burkina Faso through Bupi say the conflict is slowly putting them out of business as these traders risk losing their lives en route to their destination. Nana Sewa Bunsu is the queen mother of the Tichiman Tomato Sellers Association. <laughs> The Boku conflict has affected us in diverse ways. Our trading counterparts up north are relocating to the south and we have to risk traveling through Boku to Burkina Faso for tomatoes. Mama Faustina Donko on her part tells me that with the current happenings in the Boku enclave, the only thing that motivates them to embark on this risky trip is the current economic challenges within the country. I am Sisia Wom Papa, and you hear Pa and Yahotra, young Koda, Sansa Bokun Tokano. If not for the economic crisis we are currently going through, we wouldn't have been embarking on this dangerous journey. When you watch the happenings on TV, you wouldn't risk traveling there because even the Boko indigents are moving out of the town. So we are appealing to government to intervene for peace to prevail. Until we return from our trip, we are always not at peace. Aside the difficulties the Boko conflict bring to these traders, the high cost of fuel prices at the pumps is also compounding to their economic woes. If Yawuswa is a tomato seller here, she wants government to intervene by reducing the prices of petroleum products at the pumps. Mm -hmm. 
Sikasu ni system so bi di baba ba to ade. Enti yesra ba ni bebere se. Onti di de so mani e ma mra fom. Na yesu a di for your mama. The cost is collapsing our businesses. So onti di de. The prices of tomato is now high due to the cost of petroleum products. Na ba ni akọ fo ntosi. Ya ko fa ba mu how duty aye ba jije. Ana ni ama. I feel so cra bi nom so she box box ba de se ya djuma. So we are appealing to government to come to our aid because we pay a lot of duty when we go to Burkina Faso and this is honestly collapsing our tomato trade. Anna Sabet, Joy News, Tichiman. And that's it for Business Life for today. I am Pius Kojo Baka. You can get business stories when you log on to myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Do enjoy the rest of our programs.